Today's webinar is titled Mythbusters GeoPeer Edition, and it will be presented by Rob Condon. Rob Condon is a professional engineer with 18 years of experience in geotechnical engineering. Rob has been with GeoPeer since 2015, and he currently serves as the Director of Business Systems. Rob is responsible for business intelligence, inside sales, digital marketing, and key accounts. Rob holds a master's and bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Rob is an active member in DFI and ASCE. Rob has worked on ground improvement projects throughout North America and has extensive experience with engineering and construction on challenging projects. And with that, I will turn the webinar over to Rob. Great, well, thank you, Thomas, for that warm welcome. I appreciate it. And I wanna say hello and good morning, afternoon and evening to all of the folks on the webinar. I uh, really appreciate you all taking an hour out of your, your day to spend some time and do some myth busting along with us over here at GeoPeer. Okay, so for this webinar, the goal is basically to, to go through some things that we have crowdsourced from GeoPeer employees and our licensed installers over the years that, that we've heard that GeoPeer can't do, and to show you that we in fact can do a lot of those things with the goal of inspiring you to look at GeoPeer through a new lens and consider us on projects that you formerly thought we couldn't work on. So this is gonna focus on design and engineering myths, installation myths, and application myths. And hopefully at the end, we have enough time to do a case study to kind of tie together everything we learned. Um, a few other things to note, this is not a very technical presentation. It's gonna be quick hitting with a lot of topics that just kind of brush over the top of what we can do without getting into the nitty gritty. But if you are interested in hearing more, please feel free to reach out or put some questions in the question box and we'll answer them for you either today or in the upcoming days. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. We're gonna start off with the design and engineering related myths and kick things off with karst. So, so what is karst? You know, in the simplest terms, karst is the dissolution or dissolving of soluble rock, typically limestone or dolomite, by acetic water, which could be as simple as rainwater that has a lot of carbon dioxide in it. When that happens, beneath the ground, you start to see some of this reflect at the ground surface, and this is where you have the largest risk. So you have risks of sinkholes, like you can see in the photo on the left. You can have excessive settlement from soft residual soils. So during the dissolution of the limestone, you can get this layer of very soft clay right at the interface between the soil and the limestone that can induce a lot of settlement if the loads are heavy enough. Then you can also get pinnacled bedrock forms, which can cause differential settlement, which can cause which can cause differential settlement. I also show here a map of karst throughout the US, as well as some other features you can see at the surface in karst geology. So what can GeoPeer do about this? Well, the reality is GeoPeer can't really mitigate karst. We can reinforce those residual soils, and I think more importantly, we can offer you a risk versus reward. So the first thing we'll do is we'll evaluate the karst risk on a site. We'll look at the geotech report language to see what the geotech engineer record has to say. We'll take a look at the boring logs and the soil profile to see if there's any evidence of active karst at the project site. And we'll also look at Google Earth and karst maps to see, you know, are there, are there signs of karst in the vicinity? Is there historic data that suggests there might be karst there? And then we'll have a conversation with the project team and we can weigh out some options for them. We can use conventional wraps if we think the karst risk is low, which would be the cheaper option. We can introduce cement treated aggregate either for the full pier length or just a plug at the bottom. And this serves two purposes. Number one is it prevents raveling of a pier into a solution channel. You don't want to lose aggregate into the hole. And also it slows the introduction of water into the limestone or karstic material, which can cause solutioning to occur. Or the most expensive option would be cap grouting, wherein you put in a permeable layer at the top of the limestone to prevent water from flowing through the karst material. 
Sometimes, honestly, we don't have a good solution. If there's too much risk versus the reward, um, might have to go to deep foundations or potentially even move to another site. But bottom line is, yes, we can handle karst sites. I've also heard that geopier can't be used in expansive soils. So expansive soils are clays that are subject to shrink and swell with changes in moisture content. This swell potential is usually measured with swell testing or PVR, potential vertical rise testing, and can be as much as four to six inches in some parts of the country. What can happen here? Well, you can get some pretty significant structural damage to buildings and roads and utilities from the ground moving up and down during shrink and swell cycles. Common solutions are just to take out those high PVR soils and replace with lower PVR soils, but that can be costly. You can moisture condition the soils, i.e. put it in at a higher moisture content and kind of pre-induce that swell of the clay soils and then come back in with drilled shafts because those moisture conditioned clay soils are generally softer than what you'd want in the ground. So you have a higher risk of settlement and a lower bearing pressure that you can design for. And you can also do some construction related things like install collapsible void forms under the slabs. But GeoPeer has found a pretty unique solution that we've been able to add a lot of value on projects. So similar to Karst, you know, disclaimer here, GeoPeer rammed aggregate peers are not going to address shrink swell directly. But what they can do very well is they can reinforce those moisture conditioned soils so that you don't have that risk of settlement from these kind of softer soils that you put back into the ground. If you have high loads, you can even use cement treated aggregate through that zone in order to reinforce those soils and allow for higher bearing pressures and higher pier capacity. So the figure on the right is a good example. The lighter blue color is moisture conditioned soils and it's underlain by native soils, native clays that maybe aren't subject to, to um, swelling and shrinking. And what we would do is we'd go in, in this case, and use cement treated aggregate shown by the, the darker black color here to reinforce those soils and in fact, transfer the load from the footing through the softer materials and into more suitable bearing soils beneath. This has been a great value proposition versus removing or placing deep foundations for us. So something to consider next time you have a project with expansive soils. Uh, we, we hear frequently that you can't use geopier for liquefiable soils. So these are soils that lose their strength and stiffness during an earthquake. Typically, loose granular soils, poor drainage below the water table. And I think we all know what the concerns can be. You can have excessive ground settlement, lateral spread, and pretty massive building and infrastructure damage um, if you get significant liquefaction. So the picture at the bottom shows the cathedral in New Zealand after the earthquake event. And the, the map on the top left shows the areas that are seismically active in the United States. No surprise on the West Coast, we've got the New Madrid, in uh, Missouri, Arkansas area, and then South Carolina also has an active seismic zone, as well as Alaska. So GeoPier has a uh, actually a really good solution. I'm, I'm not gonna go into great detail, uh, full disclosure, I'm not an expert in liquefaction, but we have a three-step approach that we use for liquefaction. Now, number one's kind of the obvious one. You know, we're able to densify the soils during our aggregate pier installation. If you increase the density of the soil, it is less prone to liquefy. We can increase the horizontal stress. So the, the pier installation process increases the at-rest earth pressure in the ground, which can help mitigate the effects of liquefaction. And also the piers themselves, as the ground tends to settle, will attract some of the load associated with the, um, the ground movement, and it'll stiffen up those soils and reduce the overall um, settlement associated with liquefaction. Um, I, I personally like to see the proof of that happening. So here we have a uh, two sites in Ecuador. In 2016, there was a major earthquake in Briseño area, magnitude 7.8, PGA of 0.32G. The embankment on the left is supported on rammed aggregate piers, and the one on the right is not. And these two embankments are located fairly close together, experience the same level of uh, PGA during the earthquake. So clearly, the rammed aggregate peer supported embankment did very well, whereas the other embankment did not. 
And just in case you didn't think they had liquefaction, you can see the same embankment in the upper left hand of this picture, along with proof of liquefaction with sand boils within a couple hundred feet of said embankment. So clearly the liquefaction mitigation does work with GeoPeer. And if you're interested in more, the webinar in August will be covering liquefaction in great detail. Up next, the myth that GeoPeer can't be used in organic or soft clays. So organic soils, you've got organic clays, low and high plasticity, and you've got peats. Soft clays are typically SPTN values less than four or undrained shear strengths less than 0.5 KSF. What are the concerns here? Well, excessive total and differential settlements along with long-term settlement, right? So settlement in organics and soft clays take a long time to occur. So it's not like you build your building and that's all you're gonna get. It's gonna happen over time. And this is best probably evidenced by the famous leading tower of Pisa over in Italy, which was built on a swamp. I believe uh, Pisa is actually the Italian word for swamp or Latin. Um, so probably wasn't a good idea in the first place. And typical solutions in this case, if you have shallow organics, you can just remove them and replace them with better soils, or you can use deep foundations to bypass the poor soils and transfer your load into a suitable bearing layer. But of course, there's a GeoPeer solution. So for lighter loaded buildings with thin organic lenses that aren't high risk of settlement, we have two choices that we can offer. The first is just build conventional aggregate piers. And what we'll do is we'll use a lower modulus value in the organic soils, recognizing the fact that those soils are gonna be more prone to settlement and our pure performance may not be as good through those organic soils as it would be in the overlying clay. Another alternative is just to use cement treated aggregate through that zone. So the cement treated aggregate will provide confinement so that the pier can't bulge laterally into the organic soils and it'll help mitigate any settlement associated with that layer. For the more problematic sites with thick organic soil deposits or heavier loads that could induce additional settlement, we have our rigid inclusion solutions, three of which are shown here. So the one on the far left is our armor packed shell. This is either a 10 or 15 foot long prefabricated HDPE shell that is installed using displacement. And it basically provides a plastic sleeve that we build the pier inside of that prevents the pier from bulging laterally into the organic soils. So this is basically solving the problem where it exists using a plastic sleeve. For organic or soft clay deposits that are more than 15 feet, we have two rigid inclusion options. We have our geoconcrete column shown in the middle and our grouted impact pier shown on the right. Both of those solutions have the ability to go upwards of 45 feet. And in some instances, we can go upwards of 60 feet with those solutions. Now, keep in mind, these are all um, being rigid inclusions. They're gonna transfer the load from the footing down through the poorer soils and into a more competent bearing soil. So you have to have a good bearing soil beneath your soft organic clays in order to transfer the load. Okay, next up, GeoPeer can't be used at sites with variable soil conditions. So I've got two different scenarios here. Um, one on the left represents a site we did in Ohio in the last two years or so where we had the left side or the east half of the site was um, pretty good soils. It was a, you know, a glacial till um, type material and there was no presence of organics. And then kind of smack dab in the middle of the building, all of a sudden it transitioned to these organics that rapidly went from like five feet to 30 feet in depth. So it's a pretty big difference across the site, which as you can imagine would be a differential settlement concern. That's one instance. Another is this variable bedrock depth uh, project I looked at recently in Tennessee had this condition where, you know, part of the building had bedrock as shallow as like three feet below the finished floor. In other areas, it was more like 15 to 20. So what happens in, in either of these cases is you have a differential settlement concern uh, across the building footprint, especially 
the, the more abrupt those changes become, the higher the risk for differential settlement. So our solution for the case on the left was to use traditional Ramda aggregate peers in the areas that did not have organics. And we were able to give some pretty nice capacities per peer in those areas. And in the areas where we had a higher concern where they had the organics and you could have a high risk of settlement, we went ahead and put in original inclusions. All right, so you know, kind of a common sense uh, approach to this. We're gonna control differential settlement between the dissimilar sides of the site by having different stiffness solutions so that the overall settlement across the building was the same one inch or less with differential of less than half an inch. For the variable bedrock condition, we have two solutions. You can use traditional rammed aggregate piers where the bedrock is shallow, and then a rigid inclusion in the areas where the bedrock is deeper, again, to get rid of that dissimilar settlement and control the differential across the building footprint. Although at times, the cost of rigid inclusions can be prohibitive. So another alternative is simply to put in more piers in the areas with the thicker clay deposit over the bedrock. The more piers you have, the stiffer the soil pier matrix becomes and the less settlement is induced. So we could use a lot of piers in the areas where the clay is thicker and maybe less piers where it's not, again, with an effort to control the differential settlement across the building footprint. I get this one quite a bit. You know, I have a, a project site where I have a heavily loaded parking garage with a wraparound residential building. You see this sort of thing uh, all the time nowadays in these in these uh, town centers and whatnot. And we often hear that, you know, uh, you guys can do the residential just fine, but we're really concerned about the, the heavy parking garage. And more so, we're concerned about the differential between that parking garage and the, the wraparound residential. So, so maybe we can give you the, the residential portion, but parking garage is definitely going on deep foundations. But as you can imagine, we have a solution for that too. Um, you know, the, the easiest approach would be to use conventional aggregate piers for the lightly loaded residential structure, and then use rigid inclusions, or just simply more piers for the heavy, heavy loaded parking garage. But we find to be the most advantageous is to use round aggregate piers for everything, and suggest that the construction sequencing <clears throat> consists of building the parking garage first and topping that out. So you've induced all the load associated with the dead load of the garage, and then to build the wraparound residential structure afterwards. And that way, they kind of, at the, at the point you're building the residential, they're moving down together, and you don't get the differential between the two structures. We, we don't hear this one a lot, but I think it's an important thing to note. So a lot of geotech reports we see, soils look good. I don't disagree. You probably don't need GeoPeer. And to be honest, not every job's a GeoPeer job. If you've got no fills, consistent soils, you know, I used to write geotech reports, it'd be, you know, three to four KSF all day, don't worry about it. You know, a lot of instances, that's the case. But what if you have really heavy loads? So we look at, you know, distribution warehouses where there's 500 column loads across the footprint with loads between 300 and 1500 kips. There's a lot of economy that can be had by converting it from traditional spread footings on native soils to traditional spread footings supported on aggregate peer reinforced soils. So this is a quick example. If you have a thousand kip column load and the geotech report says use four KSF, you know, that footing is gonna have a volume of about a thousand cubic feet. But if you're able to go in and put geopiers and increase that design bearing pressure to eight KSF, the volume of that footing is gonna drop significantly. So now it's it smaller in, in plan view, but you're gonna be able to reduce that thickness. And what you can see here is a reduction of almost, uh, let's see, 60% reduction in <clears throat> concrete rebar and earthwork. And that has a cost to it. Uh, I don't know if 500 is still the case. I'm guessing that's kind of on the low end nowadays. But for that one footing instance, you're removing about $12,000 worth of, of concrete rebar and the earthwork associated with that. And each pier probably costs about $500. So 
So nine piers to reinforce that footing. Net savings for just one footing is eight thousand dollars. You know, if there's only twenty footings on a job, maybe not worth it. But for these big warehouses, a hundred footings, you'd save eight hundred thousand dollars. If there's five hundred footings, you're saving four million dollars. So just something to consider. Not every job needs geopier, but some can benefit from having them. All right, that, that's it for design and engineering related myths, although it's gonna come up again later, but let's talk about some installation related myths now. All right, this is, this is a big one. So we do a lot of work in, in cities and other urban areas where there's not a lot of space to build and or we do a lot of additions to structures. We do industrial additions and a lot of school additions. So there's a, a lot of opportunity to work close to buildings, which you know, can be a, a kind of a scary thing from a risk perspective. So we hear three things quite often. Number one is your construction equipment is gonna create vibrations. It's gonna shake our building. It's gonna crack our walls. It's gonna make our clocks fall off the wall, all sorts of things like that. That's one concern. Another concern is that putting in new foundations supported on rammed aggregate piers right next to existing ones is going to induce additional settlement between the existing footings, presuming they're not supported on deep foundations. And, th and that's a reality, but we're going to talk about how we look at that. And then also the installation of rammed aggregate piers can damage existing below grade utilities, which is also true. So how do we avoid that? So on the vibration end of things, I gotta be honest, installing rammed aggregate piers creates vibrations, right? If we weren't putting energy into the ground, we wouldn't be creating this dense column of aggregate. That energy is gonna create vibrations, no way around that. However, those vibrations from the equipment are very low amplitude at a high frequency, which I don't understand the mechanics of it all, but I do know that it, it doesn't travel well through the soil matrix and it doesn't create very high vibrations at adjacent sites. So with our equipment, depending on what we use, we can usually get within a few feet without causing any structural damage to the adjacent structure. And you know, we've done a bunch of studies. We, we have no interest in damaging other people's buildings because ultimately it's gonna come back to us in the end. So we've done plenty of studies. We know what our peak particle velocities are based on the distance from the structure. And we're usually able to control that in between half an inch per second and two inches per second, which is where that structural damage tends to occur. But a lot of times folks are still worried and I don't blame them. Um, there's, there's plenty of things we can do. Number one is we have a technical bulletin available on our website. It's technical bulletin number nine, and it addresses both vibration and noise levels and does a pretty deep dive into you know, the studies that we've done and you know, our level of comfort installing piers next to structures. We could even perform vibration monitoring. You know, if you don't believe us, we'll go out, we'll put in seismographs and we'll tell you exactly what those peak particle velocities are. And if there's still concern on that end, you can do a pre-construction condition survey, go through the building, videotape everything that they have, all the cracks, so they don't come back and say, hey, you caused that crack, when in fact, you didn't. Um, our Displacement systems tend to cause more vibrations than our drilled systems, which makes sense. So what we can do is we can pre-drill locations in order to mitigate and create lower peak particle velocities. In a worst case scenario, we can go in and install helical piers right up against the building as those don't really create any vibrations at all. And then the rest of the building can be supported on aggregate piers. And all of our licensed installers can do both, so you don't have to worry about getting two different contractors out there. How do we address the foundation load situation, though? So here I've got two footings. Footing on the right is from an, an existing structure. Footing on the left, which will be supported on geo piers, is the new structure. And they're, they're pretty close together, and I'm trying to represent the zone of influence of stress dissipation with this blue circle here. So just to refresh everyone, footing supported on aggregate piers, shed load right at the bottom of footing. The load does not transfer through a rammed aggregate pier into a bearing layer down below. 
Rigid inclusions, yes. Ram angular appears, no. So the load is shed right away, and the zone of influence from this footing will induce additional stress beneath the existing footing, which is a problem, right? It can induce settlement of the ex existing structure, which usually doesn't go over too well. So what can we do in this case? I think the first step we would take is we would go in and run a settle 3D analysis, or settle 3, I think it's called now, and try to figure out how much stress we're inducing beneath existing footings and how much additional settlement <clears throat> the load from those footings could induce beneath the existing structure. And then work with the structural engineer and figure out if that's okay. If it's another tenth of an inch or a quarter inch, maybe the building can tolerate that just fine. If it cannot, we have other solutions. We can use cement treated aggregate beneath that footing or helical piers or other rigid inclusions to transfer that load through a more compressible layer, in this case shown as a stiff clay, into a dense sand, which is less likely to settle. And what this does is it prevents, well, it basically bypasses the compressible layer, drops that load down and prevents settlement of the existing footing because all the settlement, if there's not much at all really, to occur down at depth. And the last concern is, um, you know, what if you have below grade structures? In this case, I'm gonna talk about utilities. You know, a lot of times we'll work on additions that already have existing utility lines that are supposed to remain in place and operational, particularly for hospitals. They don't wanna mess with that sort of thing. So what can we do in this case? Well, we don't want to put our piers directly through a utility. That's not only dangerous to the people installing the, uti the, the piers, but also not good for the, the functioning facility. So the first thing we can do is we can move the piers and miss that utility, assuming it is easily identified the location. We can move the piers laterally. We just got to make sure that, number one, we have enough piers under the footing to get the improvement we need and that we work with the structural engineer to make sure that footing is designed to be able to handle the dissimilar stiffness between the bearing soils in the middle of the footing and then the, the pier improved soils on, on, the, on the edges. And just to reiterate, remember that that footing is shedding load if it's traditional rammed aggregate piers right from the bottom of footing, that new load could damage an existing utility. So what we can do in this case is, again, we can use cement treated aggregate to drop the load beneath the bottom of the utility, so that utility never really knows that there's a footing above it and doesn't, we don't have to worry about damaging the utility. Okay, we, surprisingly, we still hear this one quite often. Um, I did a crowdsource and I think five people told me people, there are folks that still think we can't install below the groundwater table. So, so what happens if you drill a hole in caving soils? Well, the, you know, the, the soils just keep falling in. You can never actually get the hole open and you end up raveling this huge hole in the ground with this, you know, it's like a lateral cavity that you weren't intending to make at all. And you never actually get to the depth you want. So that, that's one big problem. Um, number two, in places like Chicago and I imagine in Boston as well, where you have these deep soft clay deposits, when you drill a hole, you know, the longer that hole stays open, the, the overburden pressure of the soil above it tends to, you know, it wants to push down and it's squeezing those soils laterally back into the hole. So by the time you might get your aggregate in the hole, your hole wasn't as big as you thought it was, right? So you're not building the pier that you think you're building. And then during the pier process, when you're building it out, you know, you could have material sloughing into the bottom. So now you're building a pier, but at the bottom, instead of being on competent bearing soils, you're, you're building your pier on sloughed sands or sloughed clays and just muck at the bottom. Or as you come in and out of the hole with the equipment, you could be scraping the sides and contaminating the pier, and, and basically you're building a mess. We've got three different solutions for that, um, kind of in order of preference. So we, kind of at the onset of GeoPier, our only solution was to use temporary casing to keep the holes open. So you know, as the material on parts of the site might start to cave, we can use temporary casing and you know, put the casing in and kind of pull it out as we build the pier. It's a very slow process. It's not preferred, it's doable, but it's not preferred from a, a production standpoint. 
So it really was the impetus for the invention of the displacement piers. So the picture in the middle here is our impact pier rig. And it's kind of like pushing a straw into the ground, except the straw has chains inside. And what this does is it basically the it's a hollow tube that creates your casing for you as you build the pier. And you put aggregate in from the top in this hopper. It flows through the pipe and out the bottom. And the point of these chains is when you advance the mandrel down, these chains bunch up and they form a surface that keeps soil from going up into the mandrel. And then as you build the pier, it creates a surface in order to compact the pier and compact the aggregate and build your rammed aggregate pier element. But as you come up with the, with the, the mandrel, these chains go lax and allow aggregate to flow through. So it's really kind of neat. And the last is our X1 technology, um, kind of similar to the impact pier, but it's, it's, a, it's a drilled solution. But if you're if you hit a caving soil at the bottom of where you need to build your pier, so let's say you've got you know, 10 feet of clay and then five feet of loose sand below the water table and then a, 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 a hard bearing layer beneath that, what we can do is we can put a, a slug of, of aggregate into the hole. And so you've got the casing from the compaction chamber, but then you're gonna have casing from the aggregate itself that prevents the soils from, from caving in. And we can do that and we can plunge this tooling down you know, five to 10 feet, and it'll be kind of self-casing as you go. Uh, on occasion, we hear we have depth limitations, and we do. We definitely have depth limitations, but it's not the 20 to 25 feet we hear on occasion. Um, so if you have a soil with 40 feet of soft or organics, don't worry, we, we can handle that. You don't have to go to deep foundations. So our track mounted equipment can go about 25, maybe 30 feet on occasion. Our mast rigs, which we have fleets of, can go upwards of 45 feet. And we even have a few mast rigs that we've tooled out to go 60 to 65 feet. So you know we can handle some pretty significant depths. Anything more than that, we don't have a solution today, but that's not to say we won't in the near future. And one other consideration of this is that you don't necessarily have to get through the soft to medium stiff clays. All right, so we say light to moderate loads, medium stiff clays. If you've got some good lab testing or you're pretty familiar with your geology, you might have some over consolidation in those clays. If you have an over consolidation pressure of you know, one KSF or even 500 PSF, you might be all right. So our piers don't have to go 40 feet. If we stop them at 20 feet, but the additional load in the soils at depth is less than the over consolidation pressure, your soils are still in recompression. You might be all right. And we're always, of course, we're, we're careful when we do this because the, the mistake between being in virgin compression and recompression can be kind of catastrophic you know, a factor of five in the settlement. So we're always careful in this regard. We'll run our settlements down to, to five, five B for square footings and 10 B for strip footings. And we'll make sure that we account for any grade race fill or slab loads that could start to chew up that over consolidation pressure. All right, on to the application related myths. We're on a good pace here. We're doing about a slide a minute. All right, GeoPeer does not do small projects. I think this is a, a Midwest thing that I've heard. So GeoPeer only works on large projects. They don't bother with the small stuff or we're just not cost effective. I'm not gonna, not gonna waste our time or their time trying to see what GeoPeer can do. Or, you know what, I can just, I can just dig all this stuff out and no problem. Or eh, GeoPeer just takes too long. Well, these are some stats I pulled from our from our CRM system. This is for 2022. So last year we did over 130 projects with less than 100 peers. We did 140 projects with 100 to 200 peers. We did over 250 projects that are under $100 for gross construction value for the contract. And just a few samples of what we worked on: uh, Aldi, Chipotle a few Taco Bells and a quick trip. I also saw, 
show an edition there in the bottom left. You know, we do small school editions all the time. Yeah, there, there's some value to be had with GeoPeer even on small projects. I, I would suggest that you don't say that we can't do small projects. Of course, that came up during the webinar. Um, I'd like to show this as an example of how you know we can add value on small projects. You know, a small project, if the soils are good, you don't need to do anything. But you know, we would get called if there's if there's existing fill soils, right, or, or a couple feet of soft materials below the bottom of footing. You know, the, the, the thought that removing eight feet of soil is cheaper than GeoPeer is is a bit mistaken. And this example tries to paint that picture. So if you had to if you had a hundred by one hundred foot building and you had to take out about eight feet of material, and that includes laying back for excavations and um, you know, making sure you get all the soil out from the zone of influence, that, that could run you about $138,000. And that doesn't account for the fact that you might have to dewater, you might have to take that to a subtitle D landfill for contaminated soils. It might not account for the fact that the soil borings didn't identify an area where it was 15 feet of bad materials. You know, wraps can really help mitigate those risks in addition to being cheaper than hogging out the material. So for this case, it's 138 to remove eight feet of material. A project like this is gonna run about 60,000 to $100,000, depending on whether you do slab support or not. And you know, we, we've done plenty of research over the years and rammed aggregate peer solutions are generally cheaper when you have to take out more than about five to six feet of unsuitable materials. And then there's the classic GeoPeer can't support heavy loads. I think someone told me they heard this from a client two weeks ago. Um, only support loads up to 300 kips, or they can't meet the settlement criteria. Heavy loads have to go on deep foundations, or GeoPeer just can't compete with deep foundations for heavy loads. Well, I sure you can. Uh, we support dozens of distribution warehouses. We support 30 foot tall walls and embankments. We do tanks and grain bins. We've done dozens of data centers for um, Microsoft and all the all the big data people. We support hospital type structures routinely, which are generally pretty heavy, and probably you know over 100 parking garages per year. So I'd like to walk through a few cases of, of projects we've supported within the last few years to kind of help paint the picture that yeah we can do this. So the first project is Project Blue Jay in Iowa. Uh, if you look in the upper right hand corner, you can probably figure out that it's an Amazon warehouse. Uh, it, was, it was a rough site. They had um, 35 feet of these kind of soft to medium stiff, stiff clays and very significant loads, upwards of 2,300 2, kip column loads and very settlement sensitive equipment. So the um, the GC priced out a few options. They said, all right, well, we can do this on conventional spread footings at three KSF, but those are massive footings, right? I don't know what size of footing with 2300 kip column loads is at three KSF, but it's big. So we were able to bump that up to six and a half KSF. So we had clear value over the do nothing approach. Versus auger cast piles, we were cheaper. We were able to cut the, um, the schedule in half, a little bit more than half. And the cool thing about aggregate piers is there's no concrete that has to cure. So as soon as we're done putting in piers, as long as there's no safety concerns, you can go right out there and you can excavate these footings and get to pouring them right away. Now, a little caveat on this, we didn't limit settlement to one inch. We were able to work with the team and have two inches of total settlement, but that wasn't their biggest concern. And often it's not. You know, the convention is one inch, total settlement, but if you can add some significant value like we were able to on this project, we said, hey, two inches of total, but we'll get your differential where you need it to be so that your systems can operate the way they need to. And it worked out great for everyone. Here's an industrial addition we did at Alro Steel in Michigan. So this was a steel coil facility. So what you can see on the Settle 3D model we ran over here on the left, you had three large mats with racks that were full of, I think, steel coils. I'm pretty sure that's right. They were 25 feet by 150 feet long, three of them. And in between, you had these cranes that ran back and forth and picked up the coils and took them where they needed to go. 
But these mats were loaded to over 6,000 KSF each. And the soil profile out there wasn't like 15 feet of clay over bedrock. It was, it wasn't bad, but it never really got that great with depth. So it's another case where we really worked hand in hand with the, the owner and the structural engineer and the, the people who manufactured the crane for their tolerances to make sure we get them a solution that worked. And we were, we were able to do so. I don't recall what the settlement, I think the total settlement, again, I think was allowed to be two inches as long as we controlled the differential. But just like what we saw on the Amazon project, we were able to really add value versus deep foundations. And they were able to basically excavate right away and construct those mats as soon as we were done putting piers in the ground, which adds a lot of value to the schedule. And we met the settlement criteria for the project. All right, this third example is a, a grain bin in South Dakota. So this is a, a big honking grain bin, 135 foot diameter grain bin, 78 foot tall, a million bushels. I don't know how big a bushel is, but a million of anything is a lot. And this is a, a slab load across the entire footprint of 5,300 PSF, and then wall loads around the perimeter at the ring of 38 and a half kips per linear foot. The site had about 15 feet of pretty blah soils underlain by glacial till. So this one had a good, good hard bottom to tag into in that glacial till. What we were able to do versus the do nothing approach, the do nothing approach was seven inches, which grain bins, you know, they can tolerate more settlement than a conventional building. But when you get more than, in this case, four inches, they were concerned about the, the connections to the rest of the existing structures out there. And I get it. So we were able to take it from seven inches down to four inches using GeoPier. And you know, you can see off to the right here for these grain bins, we install them basically in concentric rings, starting in the middle, moving towards the perimeter. And we were able to be, again, I wouldn't be showing it, but we're, we're cheaper than deep foundations. And last but not least, we have a project in Ontario called Caroline Street Residences. 22 story high rise. People usually get a little, little leery when I say more than six stories. Well, this is a 22 story high rise and it had some pretty significant settlements. So they supported the, the high rise portion of the structure on a mat foundation with pressures between four to 10 KSF across it. And then you had a surrounding three-story podium with spread footing loads up to 600 kips. So even the podium was pretty heavy. You had 30 feet of granular soils that were loose to medium dense, and then you had a really, really dense bearing layer under that. So we were able to do quite a bit. Um, we took the unreinforced settlement of this structure from six inches down to two inches, but again, controlling that minimal differential. I, I can't believe I picked three examples that were two inches of total. We, we can do one inch of total settlement. But I think equally as important is we were able to take that mat from 10 feet thick down to five feet thick. That is a tremendous amount of concrete and reinforcing steel that we were able to optimize the design and get rid of those costs. All right, good. I think we've got time for the case study. So what I've done is I've, I've taken a, an older project that, that I worked on, but I like it because it ties together a lot of the myths that we've gone through today. So this is a project in Lincolnshire, Illinois, which is a suburb kind of northwest of Chicago for those who aren't familiar. And it's basically two of these wraparound precast parking garage residential um, structures. So the apartments themselves were relatively lightly loaded, 300 kip column loads and 12 kip per, per foot wall loads, but the garages were quite a bit heavier, upwards of 1200 kips per column and 36 kips per foot on the wall loads. And you're gonna see as we go through this, there was a lot of different challenges we had to overcome. So here's how it looks in plan view. You've got the two structures outlined in blue. And then the green is the parking garage portions of each structure. And the rest is kind of the wraparound residential I was referring to. So we'll start with the easy side of the site, the west side of the site. And on this part of the site, we had a few feet of fill 
and um, soft to soft to stiff clay and buried topsoil. This was anywhere between three and 13 feet thick. And right under that, you had kind of the softer clay layer that rapidly transitioned more into a stiff to very stiff clay. And then at about 90 feet down, you had bedrock. So this is kind of just your run of the mill aggregate pier job. A few concerns on this side, uh, you know, the obvious problem soils that I identified. You did have a shallow groundwater table, so there was some risk of caving, um, and that kind of leans into one of the solutions we opted for. And then you had those heavy loads. You had 300 kips for the residential and 1,200 kips for the parking garage. So for this side of the site, we elected to use an X1 solution. So the, the X1 solution is the one I mentioned before, where you can put in a plug of stone and plunge that down through caving soils to build your pier in case it started to cave while you were drilling it out. So in, on this project, with the shallow groundwater, the variable fills, and the softer clays, we were concerned that we might get some squeeze or some caving before we got to depth. So we went with the X1 piers. And I believe in some cases we actually did have to plunge the pier down and, and use that method to deal with the casing and the need for casing. Um, let's see here, we use 75 kip elements and only used 4 KSF for bearing. We, we probably could have told them they could have used 6 to 7 KSF, but it was already designed for 4 and, and they didn't want to change it. Now the east side of the site was a, was a hot mess. So as opposed to the three to 13 feet of fill, you had three to 35 feet of fill that had debris and organics and topsoil. And it was just a complete mess below the water table. There's no way those are gonna stay open. I think it was an old borrow pit for, for something or other that they just backfilled with whatever they could find. It was, it was pretty nasty. You can see the contours of the fill on the, uh, on the plan here. So anywhere between five and 35 feet going across the building footprint. But beneath that, you had some pretty good soils, but you had to get down to them. So same same issues on this side as the other, just the soils were way worse on the east side than the west side. So what did we elect to do? So for the residential portions, where we were confident that the fills were shallow, we stuck with the 24 inch X1 and plunged as needed. On the other side, on the farther east side where the fills were deeper, we had to go with a rigid inclusion and used grouted impact piers for those parts of the site so that we could control the differential between the good parts and the bad parts. We also did rigid inclusions for the entire parking garage. We didn't want to roll the dice and, you know, maybe not identify a deep fill area and accidentally put in a, a short 24 inch X1. So we, we just kind of hedged our bets and did rigid inclusions for the whole parking garage. And we kept the capacity for both 75 kips just so the design was easy. In case conditions changed in the field, we could still use the same layout. We just had to pick which system was the right one to use. All right, and nothing's better than verification of your design. So the general contractor elected to do settlement monitoring, which we, of course, didn't mind. We were confident in our design and they monitored, monitored it throughout construction and measured settlements were right as we designed it. They were total settlements between half an inch and an inch. There was no concern with differential within the parking garage itself, between the areas of deep fill and shallow fill, or between the parking garage and the wraparound um, residential. And know that they, they did follow the recommendation that they build the parking garage first and then the residential surrounding it afterwards. All right, we're right at 152 here. So what myths did we bust? All right, well, this project should prove that we can support projects, structures and organics and soft clays. We can handle deep soil problems. This one had problem soils down to 35 feet. We can handle caving soils. We can certainly handle heavy loads. We can deal with variable soil conditions across the site and we can deal with variable loading conditions across structures. So I really like this one. I think it proves we can do quite a bit of different things on a project. 
All right, so hopefully after all of that, you've, you've all thought of some projects where, boy, I, I didn't know I could use GeoPeer on that. And that you will in the future have confidence to reach out that we can provide a solution and or, you know, at least take a look and see if we can maybe help you and help the project team move forward with the best possible foundation solution for that project. And then you can, as it says, recommend and design using GeoPeer with confidence. You know, we didn't talk much about what GeoPeer does as far as design or installation. We've had some webinars in this year that cover that. So if you're interested in learning more about our products and how we design things, um, you know, GeoPeer 101 is a good webinar and there's, there's plenty on our website that you can go check out. Um, if you want to call on a project, you can go to our website to find a local re regional engineer or you can email me or info at geopeer.com as shown below. If you want to lunch and learn on any of those topics I talked about today, feel free to go to the website or call the region engineer. And with that, I am done with the webinar. So thanks everyone for your time today.